Well, good morning to everybody. Since I've not had that opportunity to say good morning to all of you at one time. Today I want to invite you to once again open your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. And uh, we're going to wrap up this chapter today and we're going to wrap up this series on what it means to be changed. And, um, and the title today is uh, Humble Yet Strong. Now, the original title this week, I was just, you know, early in the, in the week on Monday, uh, that, you know, Pastor, we got to get the bulletin and all this kind of stuff. What's the title of the sermon? And I called it Slapdown. So they made a mock up bulletin, Slapdown. But Slapdown is really a pretty good word when we talk about being humble, but being, being strong at the very same time. Because we bring down those things that are against us uh, and, and we slap them down, but we do it through the love that has been set up in us as we walk humbly before the Lord. Well, Romans 12 is a, is a very great chapter because it is uh, so practical. And Paul begins the words in Romans 12, chapter 1, and says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world. Don't be pressed into the world's mold, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And that therefore is there for a reason because the righteousness of God has been declared to us in the previous chapters of Romans. And by the time you get to chapter 11, we're beginning to talk about the practical implications. And so what we find is we get into chapter 12, instead of what we believe, it's how we are to behave. And instead of who we are in Christ, it's what we do because of who we are in Christ. And so one of the things that we need to grab a hold of and understand is that the Bible, cover to cover even in the begots, is a very practical book. It tells us how to practically live. There are practical principles that hit us right where we are. And so today, I really want to talk about the practical principles that, that, that help us to have healthy relationships. Don't we all want healthy relationships? I mean, think about that. You know, husbands and wives want to have a, a healthy relationship. And parents and children and children and parents want to have healthy relationships. And friends and acquaintances want to have healthy relationships. And even those who are our, who are our enemies, we desire to have a healthy relationship with them as well. And I hope you understand that a little further in, into, the, into the message today. But here in verse 9... Paul wrote to us and said, let love be genuine. In other words, let it be the real deal. Let it be the sure thing. Let it be something that is not masked over with hypocrisy. And so one of the biggest differences between Christianity and and people of other world religions or of no religions is, is is that in Christianity, we're taught how to relate to people, especially to people who don't like us and to people who mistreat us. So the first few verses of our text this morning begin in chapter 12, verse 14, in which Paul says, Bless those who persecute you, and bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly, and never be wise in your own sight. So let's kind of dig in right here with these first three verses and, and discover what Paul's talking about. And the very first thing that we have to learn to do is we have to be a blessing to those who hurt us. To be a blessing to those who hurt us. You know, there are people that will hurt you. There are people who seek to hurt you. There are people that are going to treat you mean and they're going to treat you with anger and they're going to treat you with hostility. Did you see the news report, the doctor in New Orleans, a resident there uh, in training, intervened so as to to stop a street holdup, and and the the robber took his weapon and shot that doctor with his hands up, who was asking him 
not to shoot, shot him in the stomach. And he falls down, right? He's not dead. And that man comes up. There's video surveillance. He comes up and he points that weapon at the doctor's head and it jams. Twice he tries to pull the trigger. He was trying to hurt him. He was trying to inflict suffering. He was trying to take his life. And yet the Bible says here, bless those who persecute you and bless and do not curse them. Here we have a negative command and a a positive command. The negative command is do not curse them. You know, it's our human nature that when someone curses us, when somebody attacks us, when somebody comes against us, we are ready to take the offensive and go after them. You know, sometimes people wonder, you know, what the Bible says about that. And the Bible says we are not to curse them. But doesn't it just get under your skin that when you're minding your very own business, Or maybe you're, you know, just driving down the road. Somebody just flips you off with a one-finger salute. Doesn't that get get to you? Or am I the only person in the room that it bothers? You know, I, I want to take that vehicle and I want to turn it into something that will teach them a lesson. I want to put them in their place. You know, that human nature rises up. Yet the Bible says, you know, we're not to be like that. God is the only one who has the authority to send somebody to hell. As a matter of fact, the Bible says we are to be a blessing. The, the, the Greek word here, eulogio, it means to speak a good word or to speak praise. And you know, there are a lot of mean people. There are a lot of ugly acting people. There are people that will hurt you. But you know, there's a pro- principle that we have to follow at my house. My wife reminds us of this constantly. Because our human nature rises up. If you can't say something good, don't say anything. Say nothing at all, right? If you can't say something good, say nothing at all. Because you see, we are to bless. We're to to be that blessing, not the curse. So we're to look for the good in in everybody. We're to, to seek that out. Now in the Old Testament, you know what was employed was what we call the law of retaliation. I mean, that really fits our human nature a little better, it seems. Because with the law of of, of retaliation, in the book of Exodus, chapter 21, verses 23 and 24, it says, But if there's harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, and hand for hand, and foot for foot. Now, that sounds sounds man-like. That sounds warrior-like, right? But you realize it takes more strength to employ the higher standard that the New Testament gives us when the Lord Jesus teaches us something that, utter, that is utterly revolutionary. He says in Luke chapter 6, But I say to you, but I say to you, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To the one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. From the one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic. Go ahead and give them your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from the one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And and as you wish that others would do to you, do so unto them. You know, the ultimate insult in Jewish society was to strike another on their right cheek. Jesus says, if one desires to do that to you, turn to your left. Think about this. You're right-handed, and you want to punch somebody on their right cheek. They're facing you. That doesn't work, does it? You'd have to reach around in some way to punch them on the right cheek. So that, it was really a backhanding across the right cheek. Boom, right? Jesus says, when they do that to you, go ahead and give them your left cheek. Let their right hand come full force in your left cheek. You know, he's talking about a higher standard, no longer the law of, of retaliation. Human nature says, I'm going to get you back, and I'm going to get you back with interest. I'm going to smear you into the dirt. You'll be unrecognizable when I am done with you. I'm going to take you to the dry cleaners. It's going to be over. But you see, Jesus comes along and says, no. It's not even equal retribution. It's not really retaliation. It's blessing. 
So bless those who curse you. Number two, he says, be sensitive because others have feelings too. You know, as we follow this rule, we'll always be sensitive to the emotions and to the feelings of of other people. Now, sympathy, sympathy is feeling sorry for somebody, but empathy is feeling sorrow with somebody. And the verse he speaks to us here is rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. We've got two extremes, to rejoice with those who rejoice, to weep with those who weep, to cry with those who cry. Now, you may think it's easier to rejoice with those who rejoice because the motto of the world is laugh and the whole world laughs with you, but when you cry, you, you cry alone. But think for a minute, sometimes it's hard to rejoice with those who rejoice. At times, it's, it's, it's hard to, to celebrate somebody else's victories. As in this weekend that's coming up, this coming Saturday, you know, it's college rivalry day, Right? And if Auburn were to somehow beat Alabama, right, they'd be rejoicing. They'd be rejoicing under the oaks, right? Well, all you Bama fans, you're supposed to rejoice with those who rejoice. (laughs) At the very same time, there'd be weeping in Tuscaloosa. So all of you Auburn fans would need to be weeping with them. I use that as an extreme illustration. Very, very, I know, extreme. (sighs) Should have never gotten it started. And no, I watched no football yesterday. I took a break for lunch, and I watched the Harvard-Yale game, and that still wasn't football. (laughs) Anyway... It's sometimes hard to celebrate somebody else's victories. But essentially, this is saying, you know, with that, with that person who's rejoicing, you don't impose, you know, your poor feelings on them just because you're having a bad day. And with that person who is weeping, you know, you're having a great day. Everything's going your way. You've won that game, you know. It went just like the way, you know, everybody predicted. You won. But you don't gloat in that. You... You feel with that other person. Now, the Bible tells us that God considers our tears. In Psalm 86, it says, You've kept count of my tossings. You put my tears in a bottle. And and here's a a beautiful thing about our our tears. You know, my tears are written down in the book of God, in God's book. And when I weep these tears of pain, it's as if God takes those tears and he puts them in a bottle and he treasures them and he cherishes them because you see, God loves you and God cares for you and God has an awesome plan for your life. And I think about at Village every Sunday, people walk in and there are people here that that are rejoicing. There are people here that are weeping, but the principle here is we walk with one another. We rejoice with those who rejoice. We, we celebrate the victories, but we also feel with those who weep, and we walk with them in the shadows. We walk with them through their pain. So that's what the Lord Jesus did. Remember his very first miracle? It was at a wedding feast in Cana. They ran out of wine, and he turned the water into wine. And he was rejoicing with those who rejoiced. And the very last miracle that he would do is recorded when Lazarus dies, and he's laid in the tomb. And and, and Jesus comes along, and, and, and he looks at Martha, his sister. And Mary, his sister, and he looks at Martha, and he sees that Martha's crying, and he looks at Mary, and he sees that Mary's crying. And you know what the Bible says that Jesus did before he called Lazarus out of the tomb? He wept. Jesus wept. He rejoiced with those who would rejoice, and he wept with those who would weep. Third principle, be willing to sacrifice your need to always be right. Do you know anybody like that that has to always be right? Please don't punch your spouse in the side. Always have to be right. Always. And, and, uh, and, and, you know, when we think about that person who is always right, none of us thought about ourselves. 
But the Bible says, live in harmony with one another. And if I'm going to live in harmony with one another, I've got to understand it's not always about me being right. It's not about it always going my way. As a matter of fact, when when I look across this room, I see a lot of different people. And with all the different people, I, I see people with different abilities and, and people with different gifts and, and people with different talents. And some of us are singers and some of us aren't singers. Some of us, you know, do the offering and some of us greet and, and some of us open doors and, and some of us serve in the food pantry and, and some of us, you know, uh, uh, go to Bruce and some of us will go to other places. But we all have these different things. But This living in harmony is really about the law of synergy where the creation of the whole is greater than that of the sum of its parts. In other words, you know, we are better together than we are separately. We're able to accomplish more as a unit than we can accomplish as individuals. And that's what it means to live in harmony with one another. It doesn't mean that you're a clone of another person, but it means that as we work together, we we produce something that glorifies and and honors God in all that we are and all that we do. And so Peter says that we're to be sober-minded. We're to be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him. Stand firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. So, if I'm going to guard this harmony, I've got to be aware that Satan tries to drive wedges in my relationships. He'll drive a wedge in your marriage. He'll drive a wedge between you and your parents or between parents and their kids. He'll drive a wedge between friends and associates. He'll drive wedges into churches. And let, yet the Scripture's telling us, let that love be genuine. It's not to be a hypocritical love. We're to love. I had marriage counseling one day. The fellow says, Pastor, I want a divorce. I don't love her. I said, well, the Bible says you're to love your wife. Well, that kind of took the winds out of his sails. Well, you don't understand. You, do, you don't get this. You don't understand this at all. I, 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 I just don't love her, and I don't want to live with her. I don't want to live in the same house and in the same bedroom with her anymore. I said, fine. Why don't we try a trial a separation? I want you to rent the house next door and and live next door. And he said, you don't understand. I don't want to even see her. I don't want to take the chance. I said, but the Bible says, love your neighbor. He says, I'm not going to live next door to her. I hate her. I'm done. And I said, well, the Bible says to love your enemy. He grew frustrated at this point. I haven't seen him since. (laughs) But what I'm bringing across with such an extreme thought is that Satan drives the wedge. He drives that wedge deep into a relationship so as to split it open, to split it apart. It's kind of like, you know, uh, you, you've got your, your, your sledgehammer and, and, uh, and your wedge and you're splitting firewood the old-fashioned way. And, you know, it, that, that log doesn't split the first time you hit it typically, right? How many of you have ever split firewood the old-fashioned way? And you drive that wedge in, and, and you may have to pound on it several times, but, but what eventually happens, you, you split that log wide open, and there's no putting it back together. That's what Satan tries to and attempts to do in every relationship at every level. So we have to live in harmony with one another. And then number four, be kind to all kinds of people. Now that's a good one. You know, do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. In the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no room for spiritual aristocracy. 
There's no room for spiritual snobbery. No one person is a greater valued Christian than any other person. You know, we should never be able to say I'm better than somebody else. And there's a certain kind of people that I don't want coming into my church. First thing, it's not your church. It's the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And James, who's the half-brother of the Lord Jesus, he writes and says, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in, as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinction among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? And what I want to say about this is that the cross of Jesus Christ, this is the only place that we can come and have a a restored relationship with God Almighty, with with the Father. And at the cross of Jesus Christ, the ground is level. There's not a more important person to come to Jesus Christ than the lost sinner who is without him. It's not a matter of being a king or being a pauper. It's a matter of being loved by God equally. And God expressing that love through His Son as Jesus came and lived and died. And if you ever think that for one moment, uh, you know, that, 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 that you're better or somebody's greater, you just committed sin against God. In the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, it's the only place that the masters and the slaves in Roman society were able to be on the same level. And Christianity destroyed the Roman Empire because it was no longer about being a plebeian or being uh, of rank. It wasn't about a degree of citizenship, but it was about the equal ground of Calvary's cross. And so, you know, there's only one kind of person that's welcome at village. And I I want you to understand that. Only one kind of person that can come into this church that matters, and, and that person is a sinner. Sinners are welcome here. And some are saved sinners, and some are going to be saved sinners. But only one kind of person, because you see, we all need the grace and the mercy and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And then we have a fifth principle, the principle of humility. Be humble. Never be wise in your own sight. I like the way the message uh, Eugene Peterson put it. He said, don't be the great somebody. You know, there's a lot of folks that think they're the great somebody. You know, and, and the way that that we don't think so highly of ourselves, the way that we don't get so high-minded is is every morning we need to get up and and look in the mirror. Okay, now imagine yourself. Take yourself back. You got up this morning. You looked in the mirror. Do you remember that image of that person that you saw? Come on, think about that. That person you saw. Maybe you already made up and shaved and all that kind of stuff. You remember who you saw? Now laugh. Don't take yourself that seriously. You know, true humility occurs when when honestly we don't take ourselves too seriously. And and psychologists tell us that is a a, a good sign of of mental health. And and so God has a way of teaching us, you know, that that, that, uh, we can only be who we are. We can't be anybody else. You know, that's why it says here, don't be the great somebody. Don't be too proud. Understand that God made you in a certain way. And don't, you know, don't stand in front of the mirror and look at yourself and begin to sing how great thou art. But simply laugh. Then number six. We're going to take the last three verses. I had to finish this chapter before Christmas. Be strong because you will encounter mean people. This just kind of wraps his arms around it. Be strong because you're going to encounter mean people. Verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to to, to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. 
Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it's written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy's hungry, feed them. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by doing so, you will heap burning coals on his head. Don't, do not overcome, be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So the very first thing, we have to resist our instinct for revenge. We don't repay evil for evil, but we give thought, uh, but, but, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. Present the offer of peace. Now, not everybody's going to accept your offer of peace, but as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all people, with all men, with all women, with all children. Live at peace. You know, there's just going to be some people that they're not going to live at peace with you, but you are to live with peace with them because the Bible says, if at all possible, so it depends on you. From your perspective, live at peace. And you know, we've all had those people, those enemies who have hurt us in the past who've said hurtful words, who've broken our hearts, who've stabbed us in the back, who've punched us in the gut. You know, when when I've had those instances in life, man, I don't want anything to do with those people. I don't want to be at peace with them. I don't want to bless them and not curse them. I want to curse them. I want to hurt them. I want to smear them. I want to smear them like peanut butter on bread. You know? I've got anger and hurt, and I avoid. But you know, what I find is God does His work in me, and of course my wife always telling me little things too, you know. But to be able to walk up to that person who stabbed you in the back or who has hurt you or has lied and be able to walk up and see them in a restaurant and say, hey, how are you? It's good to see you. So that's what the Bible says we're heaping coals on their head. It's not to hurt them, but the whole purpose is restoration. See, that's what the Scripture is about. It's about restoration. From Genesis to the Revelation, it's about a restored relationship between man and God, God and man, is it not? I mean, we find all the way in the book of Genesis that God has begun the work of restoration. He gives us the promise of restoration. And and, and the whole deal about how we get along in interpersonal relationships is that we might walk in restoration one with another. In Proverbs 16, 7, the Bible says, When a man's ways please the Lord, even, um, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. And then, we need to sometimes just get out of God's way. He says, Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. God says he'll take care of the evil. We just have to get out of his way. It's the night before the Lord Jesus Christ is crucified. They've already broken the bread of the Lord's Supper, the Last Supper. They've already drunk of the cup, and now they've gone out to the Garden of Gethsemane. And here comes a mob in there. They're ready to arrest the Lord Jesus Christ. And there's Peter. I love Peter. Peter's my kind of guy. You know, he acts on impulse, and he's going to smear you into the dirt. And don't flip him off because he's going to come and take that finger off, right? He's that kind of guy. Do you all understand that? And he's got a sword on. He's not a swordsman, but he's got a a sword, a short sword. And he's a fisherman. And so Peter's going to stop it. And here comes a man. And Peter pulls out the sword so as to slash the man. And he goes, whoof. The guy dodges and misses it. but, But Peter catches his ear. His ear comes off and to the ground. Jesus says, whoa, Peter. This is not what it's about. And he picks up the man's ear and reattaches it. Completely healed. Doesn't even need a stitch. See, Jesus didn't want Peter to mess things up. He said, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And so we overcome evil with good. He says in verses 20 and 21, to the contrary. If your enemy is hungry... 
Or if he's thirsty, feed him and drink him. Give him drink. Right? For in doing so, you're heaping those burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Now listen to what Paul wrote to the Colossians. He said, And you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. You know, because we were sinners, because we were in sin, we were alienated from the holiness and and from the presence of God Almighty. We were enemies to God. But God said, listen, I'm not going to to give you what you deserve. You deserve death. You deserve separation. You deserve hell. You deserve eternally to be out of my light. But God said, I'm not going to give you what you deserve. You're hungry. And you're thirsty. And I'm going to feed you. And I'm going to relieve your thirst. And God is saying, I want you. In turn, because you receive my grace and my mercy, I want you to treat your enemies the same way that I have treated you. See, let your love be genuine. Man, that's challenging. It's challenging to treat our enemies as God has treated us. Has anybody in this room never been wronged by somebody else? See, we've all been wronged. Anybody never been hurt by someone else? Done dirty? Talked about? Mistreated? Persecuted? All that junk. But you see, the law of love overcomes and the law of love changes see Jesus he not only taught this but he lived it Jesus loved his enemies and he showed kindness to all kinds of people he spent time think about this not with the upper class But he did spend time with upper class, but he also spent time with prostitutes and with publicans, with drunks, with beggars. He walked among common people. You know, the people that he really had trouble with were the religious people, the ones who walked around with spiritual snobbery as a spiritual aristocracy. Those are the ones who he had trouble with. But the common people loved him. And when Jesus Christ lives in you, you're going to have a desire to relate to people in the very same way. It doesn't mean that you won't ever want to stomp somebody. It doesn't mean that. But the overarching rule, principle in your heart and in your life is to treat people with love. My son was home from uh, Baptist College uh, Friday night and yesterday, and he was helping me. We were cutting fallen trees that had fallen in the storms, and he was talking to me, you know, about his youth group. And uh, he doesn't know why he loves those kids like he loves those kids. But he's got two kids they're about 14 years old that just give him fits. They, they talk all the time. They interrupt and all this kind of stuff. And, he, you know, he's really getting a little angry with them. I was just kind of laughing inside. I was just thinking, payback. <laughs> but he says, I love them. I don't even know why I love them. You see, it's the rule of Christ. When the rule of Christ gets a hold of your heart, there is a love there that's inexplicable. It's Christ in you. And Christ in you is called the hope of glory. The hope of glory is that life will change. and Life will be different. And just think, right now, we, we go through stuff, right? 
But there's coming a day when the stuff will forever be behind us. And we'll stand in the presence of this hope of glory who's very present with us and us with him. This morning, I want to challenge you. Maybe God's been speaking to your heart. Hey, you need to get a church family. You need to get connected. We open our arms to you and invite you to come. Some of you this morning, you've never really trusted this Christ who's loved you even though you've lived as an enemy to him. And he's inviting you. Feel this tug in your heart and in your life that you need to trust him. I want to invite you to come. I just, uh, we just want to be able to share with you how to know Jesus. won't march you back and forth and all that kind of stuff. We'll just talk with you quietly and with respect and help point you in the right direction. Would you come this morning after I pray? We're going to sing. And we give you that opportunity to make a decision for Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come and bow in this place before you, Almighty. We thank you that you're a God of love and grace and ever tender mercies. We thank you for what you're doing in our hearts and in our lives and in your church right here at Village. Father, help us to be loving people as we ought to be. Lord, help us to walk together in harmony, to rejoice and to weep and to live life together before you. For it's in Christ we pray. Amen.